right, so here we are. We're up to IP 10 and 11. And strange size packaging. <laughs> so um, <laughs> we're, your attention. we're in double digits now with 10 and 11. And um, before yep. we get double started, double digits. digits. Yeah. <laughs> Before we get started into the conversation, I wanted to read a little bit from my second Bible here, Savage Impressions, um, uh, published by P22 Publishing, right? Yes. So this is my second Bible here, so it's already well-worn, and it, it's, I haven't even had it that long. So I did want to read, I did want to read a little um, snippet from that regarding this release, um, and it goes like this. So it says that this was Leischer's contribution to an artist edition periodical called I, E, Y, E. Invited artists were required to produce an edition of 200 items. The final publication contained one copy of each in a vacuum formed box. Most artists created a print edition, but in typical fashion, Leischer took the opportunity to create something a little bit more elaborate. The result is IP 10, which was a one-sided recording featuring one of the experimental film soundtrack recording in a non-standard size sleeve. I'll have a question about that. Leischer then produced a two-sided edition that was commercially available as IP10 and IP11. That's what I showed. And the package was inspired by the oversized folders that Jean-Pierre Tumel, Tumel, who had produced, um, had been producing for the seven-inch releases on Sordi Sentiment Sentimental. Um, the label in France, which put out um, the uh, Tragic Figures album. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, that was the, the first uh, full length release that he had put out. Up to that point, he had been doing the seven inch singles in these oversized uh, folders with inserts and elaborate texts. Um, I had collected a few of those. Um, he, he had, re well, I mean, He's most famous for the Joy Division one that he put out, which is highly collectible. But he also, there was Throbbing Gristle and Derudy Column and uh, quite a few other really interesting post-punk groups. Tuxedo Moon uh, was in the series as well. So how, how did you um, come, how did you two connect? Well, originally I had, um, you know, I had just been purchasing those and I was really impressed with with the packaging i just thought this is beautiful what a what a great concept and so when tragic figures came out i mean his address was on i mean you put your address on your <laughs> on your releases back in the early 80s and so i just wrote to him and i sent him a copy of tragic figures and i said i'm really impressed with what you've been creating and i thought you might uh, be interested to hear what i'm creating and he wrote back and said, I love this. I want to put it out on my label. And I, you know, I had no, I, that wasn't the reason I was sending it to him. It was just, I like what you're doing. I want to share what I'm doing. So it, it really, it, it's what opened the doors to the band uh, in Europe for the most part was that mm -hmm. release on his label. Nice. Yeah. That's a beautiful packaging as well. Much different than anything that came out yes. on IPR, but very, <clears throat> yes. very gorgeous. So you decided to go for this long um, packaging. I did. Design. So um, yeah. I have a collection of LPs, seven inches and 10 inches, and I have a hard time figuring out where this There's goes. There's no place that that fits, <laughs> except, yeah. or, you know, maybe it goes with the uh, the sorted sentimental, but it's not the exact same size either. I mean, it's, it's a little different size. So yeah, the it's... actual record is just a seven inch record. Um, a double-sided so and I love this uh, and you repeated this um, design where the the design flows so over yeah. into the sleeve I love that um, yeah it, it's very cool so can you this tell was, a that was a package that I did that I created when I was still uh, working doing my letterpress printing out of the women's graphic center in downtown LA this was before I had set up my own print shop and I remember doing the silk screening um, I, I had to get like a, a special silkscreen ink to, to print on the plastic. And I had to do it out, outside because it was just so toxic that I couldn't breathe <laughs> indoors. Of and I think that was the project that, that 
made me swear off doing silk screening ever again. And I don't think I've never done silk screening after that. So <laughs> I just realized letterpress would allow me to do more of what I wanted to do more efficiently. So that was what I focused on. It's still gorgeous. And I think that um, as far as the the numbering, so it's IP 10 and 11, I think that little yeah. that little clip that I read from Savage Impressions, it kind of explains yeah. why there's two because there was originally the bridge yes. only single sided. So the the I magazine was something that there was a, a group of artists that were publishing this um, periodical, and this was the second time I would, had been asked to contribute something to it. The first time I printed a postcard. Um, it was a Savage Republic postcard. I don't know if you ever saw the full color abstract. It, photograph of Savage Republic playing at the anti-club. But I created a, a postcard that was mounted on a, on a page that went into this earlier issue of iMagazine. And that was sort of traditionally bound. This particular issue came in this vacuum-formed box. And so it made me think, OK, I don't need to create something that needs to be bound in there. It can be something a little different. And so that's why I ended up doing the record. And there were 200 copies. And so I made a version that was Independent Project 10, which was 200 copies of a one-sided seven inch with one of those soundtracks on it. And that was what got put into the box. Uh -huh. um, but I thought, well, I want, I don't want people to have to like get this box if they want the the record so i made a second version which was ip 10 11 and i added something else to that one so the people who were just buying the record in the record stores would have you know would, would have more than what you got in the box the version that was in the box is is rarer and but there's it's less than yeah. <laughs> if you were a normal collector value added and i will say that i managed to find my copy of the i box and the vacuum formed box is literally has been falling apart for years i mean it, the plastic is just disintegrating but wow. this is wow. the i magazine and there are i don't i don't know 40 or 50 different different artists that wow. all created a page a loose page in there and there's the independent project 10 that uh, comes in in the box. Great. So, and you know, I, I should, I haven't even looked at this for a long time to see who's in it, but there's, there's some artists that have become fairly well known since then. I, there's a, there's a list here that tells who's in it. Anyway. Wow. That's a treat. Oh, yeah. I'm glad that you, you found that or were able to share yeah, it. Yeah, me too. One thing I thought was interesting also about this release, um, you mentioned that there's there's the two sides, but there's also, um, you can, side one or the 10 is played at 45 RPM and then the second side at 33. So if you flip the, the record over, you got to make sure that you're playing it at the right speed if you want to yeah. hear it. So, I thought that was interesting. Was there a reason but why? Well, yeah, I mean, the the soundtrack for the bridge um, uh, film is longer. So um, I think it's like six, between six and seven minutes. And so in order to fit that on seven inch record, you pretty much have to cut it at 33 and a third. So oh, okay. there, there are side, you know, yeah. side limitations. Oh. So, so it was actually a practical reason, not necessarily an yes. artistic decision. Oh, yeah. interesting. I mean, there's a, I'm, I'm actually in, in the midst of, of a similar thing right now because we're we're looking at doing a vinyl edition of Scenic's The Acid Gospel Experience album, which was never released on vinyl in the first place. And it'll be a double album, but I'm actually finding that in order to get the best quality sound, I need to switch the song order a little bit. Oh. Because 
you know, you don't want to go over 20 minutes on a side if you can help it. And so instead of having one side that was 16 minutes and one side that's 22, I just switched a couple of songs and now I've got two sides that are about 18 minutes a piece. So it's, it, it will end up sounding better that way. And I actually spent some time today just kind of listening to it and making sure that the, the sequence works and it does. So that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the contents of the soundtrack. Um, they're very interesting pieces. Um, I really, really enjoy them quite a bit. It's not something you'd probably listen to in the car like driving down the freeway necessarily. I mean, they're very ambient and I don't know if ambient's the right word, but uh, it definitely experimental. Yeah. Um, a lot different than um, some of your later stuff for sure. Uh, can you tell us what went into making the sounds that, that we hear on this record? So, yeah, both of these films were two films that I created while I was working out of the UCLA animation workshop. Um, which the animation workshop was the only film class that was open to non-film students. And since I was in the art department, I wanted, I originally wanted to go to UCLA to go to the film school. That was my interest when I first went there, but you had to wait until you were a junior before you could even apply. And then it was, you know, you'd have like 500 people applying for 80 spots. And wow. I just thought, I need to get into, I need to do something different in case I don't get in. So I got, ended up in the art department, um, but, but I still wanted to make films and I wanted to kind of experiment with films and, and experiment with the concept of what you could do with film. And as it turns out, Animation Workshop allowed you to do that. And you could keep taking it over and over again, a number of times. So um, I just, I basically was in animation workshop for two years uh, there and made four different films, all of which actually ended up coming out on the Sordid Sentimental label on a, a limited edition DVD that he made in, I forget what year it was, but the early, early 2000s. And um, that's something that I would, I would like to, to make another version of that. Um, because I think that the films are pretty interesting, particularly copyright 1980. Um, I was e experimenting with contact printing. I, would, I went out to this cement plant in Victorville where I took photographs with Mark Erskine, first drummer in Savage Republic. And I filmed him and the cement plant in the desert and just kind of, all these kind of really odd industrial shots. And then I took them back into the photographic dark room and I took like one foot long strips of film and I contact printed it onto one foot strips of unexposed film in the photographic dark room. And I hand developed it in the developing chemicals and then for that particular film, I solarized it, which is you flip on the light switch for a couple of seconds while you're developing in the middle of developing it, and then you flip the lights off again. And it starts to reverse things. And so basically, I ended up with all of these strips of film that were sort of evolving from positive to negative and back again. And there was sort of like this solarization effect they, they looked like it was radiated so um and i just kind of put all these pieces of film together into a three and a half minute thing and then i cre had to create a, a soundtrack for it and i was just um making like tape loops in uh, and uh, just building up tape feedback from like running tape from one tape recorder to another and so that's what that that's what a lot of those soundtracks are. So what was the source tape of the loops? Were they things that you recorded yourself or found pieces? Yeah, for the most part, things that I recorded myself. Okay. Um, I actually, I recorded a number of things down in the tunnels under UCLA in the bridge area. 
I just went down there with these and I just started recording the ambient sounds in the tunnels, but because I was stretching the tape from one tape player to another, and you would record on the first one and play back on the second one. And so you'd record something, it would get played back and then that would get re-recorded. Re and so you just start building up these layers. And after about five minutes, you get this, these weird feedback effects and screeching sounds. And it was, um, it was a, an interesting and fun process. Very cool. I think if I'm not mistaken, there's a picture in the Savage Impressions um, book with you and that tape recorder and yes. the loops, putting the loops together, which is very interesting. I did. Yeah. And I, I also did some recordings up in the Santa Monica Mountains. There were some old, like, uh, I don't know, relay station, like radio relay stations or something. I don't know exactly what they were, but I remember going up there and yeah, they were like they radar were, stations or something. Yeah, Stuff left yeah. over from World War II. Wow. Yeah, and and so that picture that's in the book is is me on this concrete platform out in the open. But there were also like these big tanks that you could like, I mean, big like water tanks. You could go inside, and there was this amazing echo. And Mark Erskine and I both went out there a few times and did percussion in there, and I taped some things. So I would imagine the reverb in there was fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Bouncing it, off the walls in a circular it, it would levitate you, yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Still. Still echoing to this day. Exactly. <laughs> the image that you used for this, can you talk about that? Yeah, so that's one of the a photograph of Mark from the the cement plant. We had this this I had him holding this silver case, which was um what the camera was in that I was able to check out from the, the film department. Um, but the background, that was just a collage, basically. I think what that was, was maybe I had Xeroxed a piece of chipboard and blew it up really big. And then I was cutting pieces up and I pasted it together. Uh, um, so, any but I just thought, I like the, the the angles and and the the black and white and gray with the red height. I just I'm I'm really happy with how that whole package turned out. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So, was there any reason uh, for the the angles other than is it like just the aesthetic look? It's dynamic. Yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I mean it, the energy just goes to mark right. So it's yeah. just it's fantastic. Uh, very cool. And this is my signed copy. Ah, yes. 214 out of out of 500. So uh. Uh. and then um so uh we were talking about tape excavation. So the I think if I'm not mistaken, some bridge stuff made it to that, right? Yes. So there is a um there's an an early there's an early recording of bridge from the parking garages at UCLA, which was uh, Dan and I record. We were trying to actually do some real recordings, so that instead of just recording a rehearsal, we wanted to create a recording that was releasable. And so Dan and I recorded the the bass and the guitar on that, and then we had Mark do his scrap metal percussion slams in the parking garage as an overdub. And so we did that on a separate track. And we actually have, I found a couple of different versions of that. And there's one version where it's it's normal speed. And then the version that we ended up using was, uh, we slowed it down half speed. So the Whoa. slams are much more intense. But. Wow. And then um, on this expanded version of the CD, I've added another track that is Mark and I, um, the very first time we uh, started working on the song, which became Machinery for Savage Republic, Mark had just finished uh, in his in the sculpture class constructing a metal stand for a couple of metal cans that he had that he was using for percussion, and so we went into the parking garage at UCLA, and and he was just kind of coming up with these this rhythm that da 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 and then I was jamming on the bass and 
So that's on that's been added to the tape excavation. We call that early machinery because uh, it's a little different. Nice, nice. Um, so how did your films do um, in, in the class? Did, did your instructor, your professor approve of the films? I Yes, I think he was very intrigued by the fact that I chose not to do traditional animation and um, but basically what he said at the time was that anything that was either stop motion or that that wasn't traditional filmmaking was fine to do in the class and i was like great i'll i'll play with this you know <laughs> and um and so I think, yeah, he was very pleased with it. And usually what happens is at the end of the term, um, all the films that got finished that term get shown in um, at a film showing of, okay, this is what the film students did. And so the, mine got shown kind of at the end of the day and it followed, there was like a, a documentary film about factory workers oh. and that was just kind of straight ahead. And then they showed my film after that of this radiated cement plant with industrial noise soundtrack. And I think people were just like, this is intense. This, I mean, there was one guy who said, we just saw, you know, life at the factory and then we just saw factory hell. And <laughs> yeah, it was, so the combination of uh, yeah. thematic material. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, the sequencing on that is just like who could have who could have planned that, right? You exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, after you did this long version, you didn't return to this. Is that correct? That is correct. That's the only one that I did that way. And you know, I I think part of the problem was just trying to sell them, you know, it's like that most record stores don't have a place for something like that. And uh, I don't know. I, lo I, don't I know. love that about it though. It's, it's unusual. So I keep mine with my 10 inches. So it doesn't, it doesn't fit. <laughs> that in my works. Seven inch box. Yeah. It doesn't fit in my seven inch box. So you could, you could get some sordid sentimental singles to go with it too. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, um, he just sent me recently, he's, he's pretty much stopped the label, but the last, the last, I mean, single that he did was this one of Pearls Before Swine oh. and Tom oh, wow. Rath. Um, live recordings, 1972 to three and 1999. He made 500 wow. copies of this. Um, so, and again, you know, it's, I mean, basically, he's got a lot of writing. He writes what he calls speculative texts. Um, and so it was yeah. nice to see that he, and then there was another one. This was a CD that he published, uh, Malcolm Duff. Um, and uh, so I think these were the last two releases that he did. He only made 300 copies of the CD. So it's probably a CDR in there but comes with a booklet and so that's the cd packaging right there that, that yeah this yeah. The, the cd is right there oh okay okay um but it all it comes this way uh. and this is the this is i mean and so his size is a little wider than mine and mine might have been a little taller i don't i don't recall yeah but and i you know the reason that I chose that size maybe had to do with the size of the chipboard that I was able to buy at the time. And, you know, and I didn't want to copy him completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it, do, it does look it's an inspiration. Different. His yeah. his things were an inspiration. Yeah. Me. I do like this about it. So it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not completely flush. So yeah. the front, front flap um, re reveals the, the actual, catalog number at the bottom that, yep. that's great i like that too yeah it, it turned out very well very well and then on the back it's pretty sparse so yeah 
That's well, the, let's see, did I, I'm trying to remember, did I do that same thing? On, the back is completely sparse on, on 10, except for the number at the bottom. This one, the shrink wrap has continued to shrink. It's getting really <laughs> more. So. Yeah, yes. With, it's interesting with the, your film project. Nowadays, a lot of that, those stylistic choices can be done digitally, right? With like solarization and those kind of things. But you were actually doing a lot of that just hands-on. My with, hand, yeah. Um, yeah. So here's the interesting thing about digital versus analog is, yes, you can mimic analog with digital. But you, there are things that you can do by doing it analog that digital cannot mimic. You just can't. And I like that. <laughs> I like yeah. I think I mean, the, uh, the, the ability to have just sort of unexpected things, happy accidents, yeah. just Error. The weirdness, you know, it, it doesn't, doesn't translate into, you know, digits, zeros, zeros and ones and stuff. Yeah. Well, it's the same with, with, um, you know, I used to have an analog photocopy machine and pretty much almost all copiers now are digital copiers. And I used to um, process photographs on the photocopy machine and the photocopy machine with the toner would give you interesting effects that you could, you can't get with scanning and, and digitizing and and you know applications it's it's a part of the inherent process of these physical toner things magnetizing to paper and you know yeah you can you can approach it some aspects of it but you can't and so you know there are certain things that I, that I used to do um, for my album jackets, like on the Human Hands um, cover with the the photographs, how those were processed, I can't get that same process now. It just it literally it isn't exist. possible, and well, I, I I'm sad about that. <laughs> yeah. you know? It's like I'm all for technological advances, but let's not throw the old stuff out, and that's that's what happens. So. And there's there's something about the physicality of a process. I mean, I remember um, being interviewed at some I don't know when we were in Europe or something for the Savage Republic. They're like, well, like why do you why do you bang on scrap metal? Uh, why don't you just sample it and do it? It's like it's it's just not the same thing. I mean, we could stand here and push a button, yeah, push and a have button. get that it's same noise. Like, yeah, <laughs> no. you know, to like you know that was the thing the 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 physicality of it and. and fact that it's not going to be the same every time uh yeah. is part of the whole process and appeal and kind of going on from that i mean this is a little bit of a tangent but have you considered doing more film work yeah video ever yeah. i mean yeah are you are you do you still mess around with that or i haven't because i haven't necessarily had the time or haven't felt like i've had the time but um i think it's something that karen would like to to do and um, to have us, and and we've certainly discussed the the possibility of of creating some some films that we could our SR two music could be used as a soundtrack for. Um, we've thrown around the idea of buying a, a little drone with a camera on it and doing some stuff in the desert. So it's it's possible. It could happen again. Yeah. Thank you so much for putting this out. Um, I don't think you have any copies. If anybody wants to buy any, I would imagine. No, but so. I remember years ago hearing about somebody in, uh, in in Manhattan finding some street guy selling records on the street, and he had like five copies of it for ninety nine cents a piece. <laughs> <laughs> wow. it probably had like That's you know great. bought in some but some distributors warehouse uh uh leftovers so hmm. uh, i did do a search today and i there i did find some copies online secondhand copies that uh, in the usual spots that people 
can yep. look at if if they wanted to find them and and some pretty low number ones I I found too yeah. so they are not a lot but there were some if you, if you do a little bit of research they can be found so anyway you want it bad enough it's out there it's out there yeah <laughs> and, yep. and I I think they're more than reasonable and totally worth <laughs> it so yeah, yeah all right Bruce right. Thank, thank you. you for coming back again and talking about this record which is, uh, which I absolutely love and the, and the size I still struggle with but I like that it's, I like that it's unique I like that it's unique but yeah <laughs> thanks again Bruce right. we appreciate you coming yeah. back on yeah good talking with you bye bye have a good night <laughs>